this is pens down. This program, the only one menu show dedicated solely to telling the storyteller stories. Here we bring journalists, we put the CCTV camera behind the scenes and we get them to tell you what their new stories and programs will not tell you. They go through a lot. This is the only place where the journalists who are the reporters or presenters become the news makers. We turn the tables on this platform. Today we are going to Nigeria. That is the most populated black country in the world, Nigeria. And we are going to the richest state in Nigeria, River States, the capital city, Port Harcourt. That is where we are today. We are touching base with the news editor. My guest today is the news editor of three different radio stations whose names have been merged into one. But he does the job of working for three different radio stations. Now, there is Cool FM, there is Wazobia FM, and there is Nigeria Info FM. All three, he is news editor. Port Harcourt, I said, the River State, I said, is the richest state in Nigeria. At least as an outsider, that's all I know, because that is the home of the oils and all that. In Nigeria, oil means a lot to so many people. So expect a very rich conversation from one of the sons of the rich seats in Nigeria. My guest today is Onyekachi Ngosu. I hope I, I got your name right. You got it correct, uh, Mr. Kwasi. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, right. I, I hope I got yours correct, uh, Mr. S okay, it is safe for me to say Mr. Steven, I guess. Yes, Steven is, is safer. At least that is much more common. Right. Yeah. Welcome to Pensdown and thanks for joining me, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate, appreciate the time. Um, I don't know. I mean, no offense, but I don't envy you. You seem to have your plate full. So much work to do. Three in one radio stations. How are you combining all these? Well, uh, Mr. Stephen, I, I don't know how to answer that. But uh, <laughs> today is a public holiday. I'm, I'm in the office. Uh, I'm wow. going to be in the office on Sunday. I'm going to be in the office on Easter Monday, Easter Sunday. So uh, <laughs> in a nutshell, that tells you how I'm enjoying the job. <laughs> it's it, it's like uh, your whole life is just uh, fixed to the job. I, I, mm. I, I mean, you know that uh, we've tried to fix this meeting for uh, months now. We've not been yes. able to fix it That's right. because of the time. So mm. I'm engrossed in the job. Uh, it takes my time. It takes almost my everything. Even at night, you're surfing the internet. You're trying to be abreast with what is happening so that you can be up to date when you get to the office. So Mm. Uh, it takes your all, but I'm enjoying it honestly. It's it's my life. It's fun. It's like your those who play football when they get into the field. For them, it's fun. You get paid for enjoying yourself. You know. Mm. Let me congratulate you and your team on uh, winning the uh, 2023 Nigeria Broadcast Award for best news station in the English language. I think that is a, a quite deserving, and you seem to have worked so hard for it. Congratulations. Yes, it's, it's a big, uh, you know, uh, congratulations to the entire team, to the mm. news manager, particularly Choma is the one for who, incidentally, I think, has also been on this, your program. Yeah, once. she was my guest some uh, time back and we had an exciting conversation. Yes, so so it's a big congratulations to, to the entire, it's, a, it's, about, it's a teamwork, so it was, mm. it was all of us who did quite well and it's what deserving, like you said. How did you discover the journalist in you? Wow. You know, I, I knew right from when I was a teenager that I was going to be, mm. this is what I want to be. Mm. Many, many years ago, I used to go see my mom on the street where she sells in Lagos, where I, was, uh, where I grew up. You okay. know, we lost our dad. I lost my dad when I was a teenager at 13. Mm. You know, my mom was a, street, a, street, uh, a roadside seller. Uh, okay. She sells with uh, newspaper and all of this stuff. So when I go to see, he, go to see her, I sit with her and I take her old newspapers to read as a teenager. You know, I'll be literally dragging a newspaper with her. You mm. should be looking at me, what is this small boy doing with newspaper? I mean, your mate isn't interested in newspaper, but I go through the newspaper, I'll flip through the front page and then go to the sport page mm. and then go to the editorials at the time. As a teenager, reading editorials of newspaper, you know? 
And I recall also when my dad was alive, I, I used to, my best program then, there's a particular, then there was no private radio, uh, private TV stations in Nigeria. We used mm. to have NTA, the Nigerian Television Authority, and they had this flagship news, news at nine. In, my, in fact, you know the their signature tune. When, mm. when it's nine o'clock, you're getting to listen to the news. That's the only network news we listen to in this part of the country. So, That's right. And then as a teenager, I don't play with that nine o'clock news. Me and my dad. I see to my dad, I'm listening to news. When my elder brother is busy looking for cartoons and movies mm. to watch, mm. I am listening to news. So I knew I was cut out for this. I just knew this is what I want to be. You know, mm. so it wasn't difficult for me to r- really, you know, get into it fully and uh, professionally too. But there was mm. there was a snack somewhere. I don't know if you permit okay. me to tell you a bit of the story. <laughs> You know, go I, ahead, please. I I I I studied accounting my first degree, mm. accounting in a polytechnic, and I did that because a man I feared, you know, respected, advised me to do it. Incidentally, the man himself is a journalist. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know this thing that they say. There's, there's no money in this job that we do. The man, the man, the man was an MD of a okay. national newspaper. And I was, mm. I was one of his, you know, private staff in his official residence. So as okay. a young boy, uh, I just finished my secondary school, struggling to get into the university. Now I was trying to do many a job to, you know, buy, to sit for some examination that would get me into mm. school. And when I got these, uh, my papers, I, I was happy. And he saw me and invited me invited me to his dining, you know, we sat together on his dining, we ate that day. And I told him, you know, what happened, you know, and he advised me, look, you prefer I go and read accounting or economics, you know. And this is the man who has risen to the pinnacle of his career as a journalist, you know, telling me not to do journalism because I told him my interest, <laughs> you know. So out of fear and respect for him, mm. I went into accounting. My brother, I struggled. I can't forget my first two years struggling to get ND certificate. It wow. was a struggle of my life. Mm. You know, you 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 literally, each time I'm coming home, my parents will know that it's like they are writing an exam because I will grow slim. I mm. will, you know, you will, you will know that you think I'm sick because... The I'm course was having a to toll on you. Heavy toll on me. You know, so I struggled through that ND and thank God I managed mm. to come up with a pass. Wow. You know, so you know, so it was it was a story of my life. It was a story that I really can't forget. But then after then I've gone further to do one or two other things, you know. Mm. What stands out as the most challenging assignment for you? You've been here for a decade or maybe a little more. Okay, uh yeah, the most challenging for me was when I was uh I was I was a pioneer editor, news editor of a private radio station in Calabar. Calabar mm-hmm. is also in the southern, south south part of Nigeria, Cross mm-hmm. River State. Uh, it was a private uh, 2015. Yeah, 2015. I that was when I that was the year I got married, incidentally. Our son just came. It was a few wow. months when my wife put to bed, and then I had to move to Calabar. I had to leave IE and Port Harcourt to move to Calabar. Wow. So it was mm-hmm. for me. But on the job professionally. It was uh, in course was it? I was leading the niche team, and we had, you know, very young people who were not, uh, they're new to the desk, mm. they are new to the job, they are new on the field, you know. So I needed to brush them up, I needed yeah. to put them through, and you know, there are rules guiding our profession. There are mistakes you don't make, or else you get shut down, you know. That's so right. all of those things were challenging for me, and what what I did was I, I had to shuttle between the studios and the field. I had a colleague who, who was more experienced, you know, because I host I, I used to host a show there and then in Calabar. So I had to invite my colleague to come join me in the studio. At that time, I leave him in the studio and then go to the field because I need to be able to cover a lot of ground. So that particular experience was very challenging for me because uh, you know, uh we, we had other stations that came up that we also then I think we were about three years then. We had one, one other station that came up. That was also in competition with us, so we needed to, we needed to, 
continue to have that edge over them like we've been having yeah. before the election. It was a local government election, it was a grassroots election. I needed to organize, I needed to mobilize, I needed to finance, which was not coming forth. But then each time I look back, I remember I say to myself, I think I did well because honestly, it's part of my 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 my, my resume that look, this is what I did when I was in Calabar. I'm happy when I left Calabar, really. These young people that I left continued. They never brought anybody to take over from, from me. You know, my assistant took over and continued, and then they grew from there. You mentioned that 9 p.m. news you would not miss for anything while you were growing up. That was the time we talked about the awesome power of the media and the fact that the media controlled the narrative in its absolute sense. Today, there is something called social media, and its offshoot are the citizen journalists. They have, number one, taking breaking news away from the traditional media. What you may capture and think is an exclusive, you go online and somebody posted it two hours ago. That is how fluid things have become. But from where you sit and walking through the years you have been here, has social media redefined the boundaries of journalism? Yes. I will I will say yes to that. They have social media has really redefined it. However, if you know your onions, if you know what you want in this profession, it won't take you out of job. Uh, because a lot of the guys in social media may not really be termed as journalists, mm. really, because it's it's all commas affair, sort of. You know, anybody can take your phone and do whatever, post it, use, you know, get a domain name and then you yeah. start, uh, you become a citizen journalist. So, so uh, in addition to what I do here, I also represent my station at the River State Government House. Okay. And there are times we engage in conversation because we will have a lot of media houses that mm -hmm. also have their reporters there. So we engage in conversation. So I pick a few of their words and I just tell myself, these guys are not journalists. So mm. why, you know, gone with this kind of conversation so social media has come to stay we can't run away from it really mm. but there is a place for the conventional media and that place okay. still stays mm. uh, that is a professionalism that will bring yeah. uh, into our reportage mm. which you don't get on social media and mm. however the social media guys may have done however the platform may have panned out mm. The decision maker still realizes that look, you cannot do without the conventional media. Yes, yeah. they use the social media guys, like in this part of the world, they use them mm -hmm. a lot. Even where uh, the government has, where I just mentioned, they use them, they use them a lot. But then there are information that look, it, it, it can only really become believable when it is heard on radio or when it is read on newspaper yeah. or on TV. Yeah. By the time you keep joining them out through the social media, a lot of people will say it's social media. You know, there's this, that, there's still that snag, that you know, yeah. doubt about the authenticity of the information you get from the social media, unlike what you get from the normal uh, conventional media. So, for us, the practitioners, we need to understand this, have be conscious of this, be deliberate about the way we carry out our assignments. And not, I don't see the social media guys as a threat. I never see them as a threat, really, because we'll have several platforms that we can explore and then, you know, churn out our write-ups and uh, whatever we'll do beyond. Uh, I see, unfortunately, I see a lot of my colleagues who feel that social media, who are even leaving the conventional media to set up a platform of their mm -hmm. own and then, you know, begin to do what not. But I, I really don't see them as a threat because in the profession I would do, there are several ways that you can, you know, sell yourself, sell your your craft and sell whatever you do. Uh, not seeing social media as a threat at all. Mm. But so how come that in Africa, social media has created richer bloggers than richer journalists? You and I have been trained on how to use platforms of mass media information dissemination to carry out news and information to the public. But here we are that people who are scarcely trained in the kind of skill we have are making a, a windfall out of social media. Where did we go wrong? Where did we miss it as journalists? Well, it depends on your, 
what you mean by they are making it, if, if that's what I understand yes. by what's your question. Uh, so we now have to define your definition of uh, making it or being wealthy or being rich or something. Okay. Uh, for you, it may be maybe they are driving flashy cars, they live in bigger houses mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. the normal, than you and I. So yeah. uh, for me, it may not be that. Okay. Uh, I feel I feel contented when I'm able to go to the U.S. Embassy mm -hmm. and as a journalist, I represent this platform and nobody blinks an eye because, because of the kind of job I do. And yeah. I can go to Germany for a holiday. I can go mm -hmm. to Miami to rest with my family. Uh, I can go to Dubai for, for a visit or something. And, and I'm contented with the fact that, look, I, I don't necessarily need to uh, drive flashy cars. You know, I don't necessarily need to live in a big house for me to know, look, I'm okay, I'm fine. Uh, as far as I can pay the fees for my children, take care of my family, you know, I, I think I feel okay. For me, uh, an average journalist should be able to afford some of these things. Uh, the job that we do opens the door for to you for, I mean, open this door, open, opens any door for you if mm. you know what you're doing. You can pick up your phone and dial any number. I mean, like they say, they say you just you just have three or four persons between you and the president. I mean, you can reach out to the president at any time, and that gives you connection to what you need to do. So I do not agree mm. uh, that those guys who, yes, we have a lot of them here as well. I mm. must admit, we have yeah. a lot of them here on social media. They call themselves content creator or yes, yeah. uh, was what, what influencers. Influencers, you know, influencers, <laughs> and they make a whole lot of money. You see them in, in dollars, even they are millionaires in dollars, honestly. <laughs> you know, so, but then I, 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 I honestly don't, it, it doesn't worry me. Yeah, it doesn't worry me. I'm contented mm. if, if I can take you of my home, mm. uh, I can take my family to for a holiday somewhere, even in Accra, I come to a holiday in Accra. And stay. Yeah. You know, mm. I'm, I'm fine with that, honestly. Mm. Does journalism pay? Yes, it does. It pays. If you know what you're doing, it does. Mm. It if does we pay. are to roll <laughs> back, <laughs> if we are to roll back the hands of time, 12 years, are you still going to choose journalism or you take a you take a different turn? I will choose journalism. I, I will choose journalism. Maybe I'll do it a bit differently from mm. the way I have practiced it. You know, there, there's, this, there's, there's this thing, and we're all, we all caught up in it, really, I must admit. There's this thing okay. in, in our part of the country that we call brown envelope. I don't know yes. how it's called in, in Ghana. Uh, I was in Kenya uh, sometimes, mm. about two years ago, for a conference. And uh, we're about 12 of us from other African countries who converged mm. in Nairobi for a meeting. So uh, they also talked about all of this. We, we call it brown envelope. They have their different names for it. Yeah. So... I know uh, as a startup, as a, as a startup, then I got caught up in all of this. So that mm. took your time. And then you feel like this is this is the way to, the way to go. Mm. This is what is in, in, in this profession for me. Of course, that's not. I realized this very late. I've gone like five, six, seven years before I realized that, oh, no, no, this is just, uh, this is not, this is just crumb and peanuts. There's something deeper in journalism. Mm. I mean, there are low-hanging food that you can go uh, go for fellowship here and there. You can apply for funds to do reports, to engage in mm. investigative journalism and you get paid and recognized by international organizations. You can you can attend different functions and you get sponsored. All of those, I feel that is a peak of journalism. That is, if I have the opportunity to start up again, I will start up that way my first year. In fact, my first month, I won't waste another five or six years, you know. Mm. A lot of our colleagues are living highly trained, highly qualified, experienced. They are changing uh, the the gear. They are shifting gear. Some of them are moving into public relations, corporate communications, politics, and almost everything in between. Attrition in journalism. It appears to be so high. What is going on? And from where you sit, what do you think is accounting for that? First, I think one, you need to be passionate. You need to, you need to have a passion, mm. uh, you know, for what you do. Mm. Uh, but as a journalist, I do not think that it stops you from, you know, branching off into some other things. Mm. For instance, uh, those who are getting into uh, public life, 
public practice, maybe getting into government to work with a particular politician. I've had colleagues who go into that too and still come back after uh, maybe serving with a particular public officer mm. for four years or or eight years. They still come back to journalism. I can mention different names here. You know, mm. they still come back to journalism. You know, it doesn't take you entirely away from your career, but then you can branch off and do one or two other things in the public sector. So you can branch off. Uh, I I I, did, I have a certificate in public relations from Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, but okay, it hasn't taken me away from from journalism. So. Mm. Uh, so I, for me, passion drives me really. Passion mm. for the job. That's why I can stay in the office on a good Friday, or uh, on Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. On Christmas Day, we'll come to work. I'm sure it's the same thing everywhere. everywhere. You, you don't turn down the radio because the radio station because uh, it's a Christmas day or it's a it's an Easter Sunday. So, but it's because we are passionate about it yes there yeah. may not be that uh, we may not be millionaires in dollars and pounds mm. but then i think uh, contentment is key for me mm. uh, and i think uh, before anyone can anyone who says uh, he's leaving journalism because it is not paying him apparently mm. uh, mr something from the beginning from the onset that uh, uh, but that's what i think you probably you apparently missed out something uh, journalism pays if you know what you're doing, please. I've had colleagues who have gone into training, training journalists. They do that and they are supported by the EU and other international mm-hmm. organizations. They make money for me. They are also practicing. They have journals, they have newspaper, they write. You still somehow remain on the job. You don't entirely leave it. Even if you're going yeah. to public relations, working for anything, you still remain somehow around the spheres of, the, of, of, of uh, journalism. You, you touched on, on it earlier, but now let me make it a a main question for you and pick your thoughts. In Ghana, we call it solid, which is the short form for solidarity. In Cameroon, they call it brown envelope. Nigeria calls it brown envelope. Malawi calls it logistics. In Liberia, they call it professional services. Kenya, oh my dear, I forgot it. But they also have brown envelope and there is another popular local name for it. It appears to have a surname in various African countries. The... <laughs> that is, and, and all we are talking about is that envelope bearing money, which is handed out to journalists after some assignment or after they go interview that public figure or newsmaker, basically. These days it can come in other forms. Uh, paid uh, uh, capacity building project uh, 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 programs. Okay. Uh, maybe they could even sponsor your child's naming ceremony or even your wedding. They could give you a scholarship to take a course in some school. Or, I mean, various forms of it. Shopping voucher is an example. Some weekend getaway for your family at some exclusive hotel or resort, whatever it is. We are talking about the same thing. Different names, different countries. I want your take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I'm just wondering how you you're able to gather those names. No, you, <laughs> you know, did your research. And then... The good thing is that the guest profile for this show is global. So for the past more than two years, I have interviewed almost 150 journalists from five out of the six continents. And curiously, outside Africa, you don't hear names for those things. I speak to people in Canada, US, UK, they tell you it doesn't exist. Indeed, even in Africa, in South Africa, they said it is frowned upon. Because of that, journalism is taken as a serious business and they pay them very well. So in South Africa, being called a journalist in the real sense of it is a big deal. But let me have your thoughts. Okay, I, I think I, I, I'm I'm lost sort of in in the last comment that you just made. Now maybe mm. I should just pick it up from there. Okay, that's uh, fine. And, I, I, and I, I, yes, because now I don't know how strong and how equipped the regulators are in some of these countries. That okay. is key for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, those who regulate journalism. We'll have a lot yeah. of unions and associations here in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. We'll have the Nigerian Union of Journalists. Yeah. We'll have the Nigerian Guild of Editors, Nigerian mm-hmm. Press Council. They all have their different rules in regulating okay. what to do as pen pushers. So, mm-hmm. But then the problem is, 
these unions and associations and organizations have been the real sense of it being hijacked by politicians, you know. Uh, or if they've not been entirely hijacked, you realize that those who are aspiring to lead these unions and organizations are those who are trying to use those unions as a launching pad to get into mm -hmm. the minds of those in the past, those in the power, that, those uh, in authority. In the corridors so of that power. They recognize that, you know. So when it gets to election season, you of course will come and you, you invite them as a union and mm -hmm. then, you know, give them the largesse, you know, the bigger, <laughs> bigger brown envelope. This this time it doesn't come in envelopes, it comes in a larger form, you know. So that's, that, that for me, I think is a, is a, is a problem. Yeah. The regulators who have not mm -hmm. had those who understand what they ought to do really. But there are people who have taken it upon themselves to say, mm. look, this is not why I'm in this, on this job. This is not why I've come into this profession. This peanut can't take me anywhere. You know, you must, you must be deliberate about it. You must yeah. be, uh, tell yourself the truth. This is not why I'm here. I must get, however, there are challenges. I've worked in media houses where I don't get paid. I never got paid. I work in a media house for one year without earning a dime, a salary. You know, so that was when I was starting. To be honest with you, Mr. Steven, I survive by brand envelope. Yeah. It's a practice that's, that's here too, I so I'm not surprised. Uh, so that's how I survive. But looking back now, I won't do it again. Yeah. At, at my age and experience now, I cannot work in a media house where you don't, I don't get paid. It can't happen. Mm. I won't do that. You know, I'd rather start up my own and just sit in my house and, you know, look for something that will, you know, that will get me money. I won't mm. work for anyone who will, not, who, will not, who will not pay me. So so the issue of brand envelope is really a big problem. It's yeah. a big problem. I think the, how, the best way to solve it is to also look at the regulators, like I mentioned. They need to come clean. We need to look at those who are aspiring to lead these organizations, these, these unions. Uh, like I mentioned, the NUJ here in River State Park in, in Nigeria. Journalists don't take them serious. Mm. We, the practitioner, we don't take members, leadership of that union serious. You, yeah. you, the way they carry out their function, you just know that this person's intention is mm. just to get himself acquainted with those in, the, in authority. That's, that's the only reason why most of them get into these offices. So that, for me, is a big challenge. And again, those who practice journalism, how do they even get into journalism again? Because journalism looks like all commas are fair. If you do accounting, you can come into journalism. You know, if you study accounting, you can come into journalism. If you study medicine, you can practice journalism. So in Nigeria here, I think that the NUG is trying to regulate that. I don't know how, uh, how they've been able to achieve that. If some of their rules and regulations have been able, if they've been able to enforce their rules and regulations. But I know there was a time they came up with ideas on how to ensure that you do that. You cannot get registered if you don't get a particular certification. I don't know if that is practicable, how far they've done it across the state. But I know in some states, it's been practiced, it's been enforced. So uh, that also, I think, is a challenge also mm. in the job that we'll do. But in all of these, uh, the truth is that what any other prof profession in the world, the medical doctors, the lawyers, yeah. they have their own challenges. D yeah. is our own challenge. So we must, mm. we must tackle it head on. Uh, we mustn't look at it like, uh, like uh, you know, it's, it's something that can't be solved or it's just... Mm. Uh, this happened only in journalism. No, it happens everywhere else in, 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 in the medical profession, the legal profession, whatever. The engineers, they have their own challenges. At least we, are, we, are, we, are, we speak with them every time. We know their problems. In fact, they come to share their problems with us so that we can help them solve it. You know, mm. So we know their problems. So I think, I, I, I think also that uh, uh, th there's some level of improvement in what we do compared to mm. when I came into the job some measure of improvement, the kind of people that work, that, that uh, come into the profession now, the kind of thing we hear, there's some measure of improvement in the job that we do, beyond the brand envelope, beyond the other negative uh, things mm. that you've mentioned. Let me put you on the spot. In the line of duty, have you ever been approached with anything financial or monetary to compromise the facts of any story you were doing and their tickets? Okay, uh, in the course of doing my job, uh, yes. well, it, it may not be 
for me to compromise. It may okay. not be directly take this mm. uh, so that this doesn't happen. Mm. You know, but then I, of course, in the course of doing my job, I have been, you know, at the end of doing a job, offered something. Okay. That you know that uh, you, of course, now you can't. You shouldn't do this now. This person has given you this. <laughs> then you shouldn't do this. That's right. <laughs> that I, was unspoken agreement. Like yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like take this so that you don't do this. But then we appreciate you for coming, and uh, we have, you know, like. Uh, what was the word that they call it in Ghana now? There's the word you call it. <laughs> one for the road. <laughs> <laughs> Medasi. In Ghana, Medasi. There's a short form you called earlier. Soli. Uh -huh. What's the full? That is solidarity. No, there's a full... Solidarity, okay. That's okay. right. <laughs> All right. So, so, so maybe, maybe what they gave, what, 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 what they gave, or what they gave then was uh, solidarity, mm. kind of to say, okay, take, take for your transport, take and buy fuel for your car, you know, sort of. <laughs> Let's talk about your golden memories. Golden memories. These years you've been here, which events or incidents or periods stand out for you as the most cherished. Uh, this is uh, you're not putting me on the spot, honestly. My golden <laughs> memories. I, I at times I feel like I'm just starting up, really. Um, okay, so so the other was um, also when I was in Cross River State, I had the privilege to speak with uh, the first female vice chancellor of uh, the University of Calabar. Okay. She's still in office. I was the first journalist to interview her. Mm -hmm. I was also in her office. I went to see her. And I had her preview. It was also during the COVID-19 era. Okay. Uh, I can't forget her. She's a professor, uh, Professor Florence Obi. Okay. Uh, she's still the vice chancellor of that institution. So I had the privilege to speak, to speak with her. There's also something that happened to me. I was almost arrested in the course of doing my job. I was it was in wow. Mumbai courts here in 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 Calabar. I went to do an interview and I was arrested, not almost arrested. You know, <laughs> I remember some of those 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 incidents fondly, really. Mm. Because I can now tell someone that look, you don't do this, you don't do that. So yeah. it was my boss that came to my rescue and then I was asked to go. Mm. Wow. Wow. Should journalists be licensed? As individual, will you agree to calls for the licensing of journalists? Yes, as individuals, as it is done with their lawyers, you are licensed to practice. Well, uh, I I probably won't agree uh, mm. or subscribe to that. Uh, I rather the regulators. You know, sit up to their responsibility. Uh, you know, whatever you you think you'll achieve by licensing a mm. journalist, you can also achieve by, you know, regulating the activities of the practitioners. You know, yeah. following through what they do, and then within the basic what is necessary, then asking them to asking that they be licensed, like uh, medical practitioners have done. I, I do not think. Uh, that will be necessary. If you do that, how then will you will you also license the freelancers? Mm. Those who want to go into freelancing, how yeah. would you how would you license them? You know, mm. so so I do not think uh, I I would not subscribe to that. Political ownership of the media, politicians, top class politicians own very influential media houses across Africa. Are we sitting on a time bomb or there's no cause for alarm? Is there a healthy development? There is cause for alarm, my brother. Mm. I I am worried. Yeah. I am worried and I, I must be honest with you. Mm. Uh, I mentioned to you that I've worked in a few media houses where I work for free. It wasn't like yes. money wasn't coming in. 
Mm. You know, but we weren't getting our paycheck. Mm. But we know that these guys are making money. You know, so mm. now uh, it's impede on our professionalism. The whole yeah. uh, when you work in a media house that is owned by politicians, don't know who is interested in a particular um, decision of government. You know, yeah. there are things you can't say. Yeah, you cannot be professional in such a place. You you dare mm. not, or you go. You, you they show you the way the way out. Yeah, you know. So for me, that that is a time bomb. Honestly, it's a time mm. bomb. And for us here in Nigeria, the NBC that issue licenses to mm. those who own own media houses. That is where yeah. we need to know exactly who this person is. Is it should it be an all commerce affair? Because mm. you have the paycheck, you have the watches, then you can't get yeah. you can get the license. Uh, I think we sh- there there is need for advocacy in that regard. Mm. We need to begin to advocate for these regulators, this NBC, like we call it here, to see reason why this thing should go to those who are professionals. But again, the politicians at times front journalists to get this license. You know, at times you see a politician, he brings out the cash, but he uses a media practitioner like mm. you and I. To get yeah. the license and then the business start and then you don't you don't steal towards a particular area. Uh, for for us, we we'll have some political parties here. I can mention yeah. the PDP, Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, if someone who belongs to a P owns a radio station, a TV station, a newspaper, you have to be careful what you write about his party or his ambition. You yeah. Know? So it's a big problem, Mister Steven. Mm. It's a big problem. I must admit that. Mm. Mm. Uh, the romance between you and journalism is it till death do us part, or there's going to be divorce at a point? There's certainly going to be. I don't use the word divorce. <laughs> it may be separation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I've already started uh, making plans, but it's still mm. in this. I, I said I use the word separation. of it, you know. Mm. Uh, Things are changing. You know, mm. you need to change with with, with as the times are changing. So yeah, podcasting is what I need to. I need to. I want to go into podcasting. Mm. And, you know, so uh, I've started the process. Okay. You know, yes, this second quarter I should start up uh, basically mm. on environment, the climate. Okay. You know, uh, the process should start up by April. So. That is where I want to veer off into. But, you know, that's not entirely living journalism. I'm, I still work where I work. Yeah. Uh, but that's just uh, like what we call, we call it side hustle here in Nigeria. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's why I said it's not really a divorce. I, I do not think, I do not, I, I, I do not think I want to entirely live this, honestly. Mm. I've done it virtually all my life, really. So, as soon as I read you, you know, so... Mm. If today a mentee or your own child tomorrow walks up to you and says, uh, I'm thinking of going into journalism one day, is the person getting your blessing? If he will or she will, what is that advice you give that person? Certainly the person will get my blessings. Mm. And the advice I will give is, look, I will point him or her to the right direction. And what are these right directions? I will let him or her know that, look, mm. don't be carried away yeah. with the multitude. Mm. Though it, it's not necessary. I mean, the, I always tell people, look, if I'm the lone voice in the wilderness, honestly, mm. I don't mind. It doesn't even make me wrong. Yeah. That I'm the only one seeing a particular thing does not make me wrong. Mm. So I will tell the person, look, don't follow the, follow the crowd. You can follow them to the wilderness. Yeah. Just be sure of what you want. And I point to you, uh, to him or her, these are the things you need to do. You need yeah. to ensure that you, you couch a niche for yourself. You need to identify the area you want to, you know, concentrate on. Mm. What kind of journalism do you want to do? Uh, do you want to, I, I rather, you know, like for us on radio, there's no, there, there wasn't too much of beat reporting. You yeah. know, like newspaper guys, where you have mm-hmm. crime, there's health, yeah. there's all of. But radio, you know, you do all everything. So, yeah. and that's the advantage the, the the newspaper guys have over us. So, I rather you concentrate on a particular bit so that you explore it, even internationally. If you're going mm. to be a health correspondent or a health reporter, 
you explore it, look out for some of those uh, World Health Organization, they carry out project programs mm. that journalists are invited to cover, journalists are trained, you, you know, I mean, I mean, go international, think of something mm. to do. You must take your mind away from some of these brand and below that comes. They won't get you anything. That would be my advice to you, because I would definitely not stop anyone from getting into journalism. I won't. Maybe this will be like my last question. The field of journalism is awash with a lot of landmines, clear and present dangers every day in the line of duty. Has your life ever been threatened in a line of duty before? Yes, I have. I have been threatened. While on radio, I mean, just a few years ago, about two years ago, I was on radio hosting a show. Mm. And I've had callers call me to say, I will deal with you. Threaten me live and I, yes, live on radio. Live on radio, and I, I didn't surprisingly why the person was saying that. I didn't yank the person off. I allowed him to finish what he was saying. I didn't know my boss was listening, or somebody has listened and told my boss. My boss called me that somebody told him that somebody threatened me off on on radio. I say yes. So I told him, she asked, "Why didn't I say it?" You know, so. I don't know why I didn't say it, honestly. I really can't explain why I didn't tell my boss about it, but she heard about it, and then it has happened. Like It happened in that particular, my last station before this, about two, two occasions, you know, that I got a threat. That, look, I will deal with you. I will, I will show you. I know, you know what, that, what that means. And it was uh, when we were getting towards political, uh, when we were get, getting towards the last election here in Nigeria. Mm. Just this last election was on the eve of that last election. So, we get a lot of that. So while I was also in my other station in Crossroads, I mentioned to you that I was arrested. My boss came to, you know, yeah. to bail me, you know, while I was arrested. So I've got a lot of that. Maybe uh, it just prompted me to begin to document some of those things. Really, I've not oh. taken my time to say, okay, I need to begin to write out and itemize some of those things for, for future reference and for uh, people coming after me to also learn from them. But I have, I have, I have seen some of these things. I said that was going to be my last, but forgive me. Journalists hardly run out of questions, unfortunately. Um, I am giving you an opportunity. Two people, two international figures you would love to interview if you have the opportunity. One male, one female. Who would they be? Okay, the line isn't clear. I am giving you an opportunity, two international figures that you would love to interview if you have the opportunity, one male, one female. Who would they be? Okay, I, I said President Vladimir Putin of Russia. Okay. Any reason, special reason, baby, we are interested. Why did you step back? <laughs> 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 yes, I, I'm interested. I mean, he's he's just a he 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 he, he looks to me like a man who, who. In fact, not that he looks to me like a man who he's getting at something. He's playing a chess game, and mm. he's just playing it, and he's getting result for me. Mm. Yes, he may be negative. A lot of people may not like it, but then he's he's a he's a, he's a goal getter, mm. and he's getting results. He's getting what he wants. He's playing the game. And people are falling into traps. I'm looking at the game like what's this guy playing games like this, and people are falling into, falling into this into his hands. And I'm like, what's happening? So I need to know what uh, where he has got that guts from. Mm. Wow. Let's talk about the female because it looks to me like a man who has who has the guts, who has you know, he's not afraid of anybody. Yeah. So yeah. Who is your female pick? Okay, the, the female for me, yes, he's a, she's a Nigerian in, in, incidentally. Okay. In fact, I named my daughter after her. Yes, okay. I named my daughter after her. Yes, her name is Chimamanda Adichie. Oh, okay. 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 The danger of yes. a single story. Yes, she, yeah. Yes, uh... Incidentally, I, I've not taken my time to read her books, but then mm. each time I listen to her talk, I get inspired. Mm. She speaks so intelligently. 
And I like, ah, I wish my daughter would be like this. <laughs> I just, when our daughter came, I I I I took my wife's but I I I I with my wife's permission, I mm. said no. I need to bear this name, you know. I gave her the name. <laughs> you know, so she's one lady I admired so much, and I like mm. to one day have the opportunity to speak with her. That's a prolific that. author, very prolific author. Yeah. Right. Uh, before the internet gives up on us, thank you very much for this conversation. I think it's been exciting. Uh, a lot has been learned. Thank you for your perspective and opinion on media matters, as well as the bit about your own journalism journey that you've shared with us here on Pens Now. We are very grateful, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I must, I must appreciate you and thank you for your patience. You've been patient. Thank you. I've learned patience from you. You're patient 101 or patient 102. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> Most grateful, sir. This has been pens down. Today we travel to Nigeria and we touch base with one of the news editors in, Ni Ni uh, in Nigeria. He handles three different radio stations all put together into one and he's news editor. You may not envy him for the load of work he carries. As to how he's able to juggle that, I'm sure uh, he himself probably doesn't even know how he does it. Thanks for joining us. We are back again with another colleague and we'll still have the same menu, journalism journeys. That is all we do here. We'll be back. Thanks a lot and bye for now.